at the sepulcher in John 20, 17. Why? Because he had not yet ascended to the Father. He was at the door of the tomb. His earthly portal back to his glorified state was a tomb, not a tabernacle. He ascended and presented himself before the Father before descending back and giving us the mission of God. The work of claiming the victory over sin is done. Now we go forth claiming our inheritance in Christ. That's what we do. And there's a book called The Land's Book of Life. And if you're saved, you know what? Your name is written in it. And you have an inheritance. It's a wonderful truth. If you're saved, your name is written down in glory. And it's yours in his heavenly temple. So let me ask you again. I'll ask you where, I'll go back to where we started. How are you doing today with claiming your inheritance? There's a time when the word of God becomes personal, when God moves us to victory, and he points out to us the steps that we need to take to claim our inheritance. Just as the children of Israel gathered at Shiloh, we gather this morning for those same purposes, to make a decision, to claim our division, and to show appreciation. And we have to evaluate. I can't do that for anybody. I don't even know who I'm talking to. I'm just talking to me this morning. But perhaps the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and he's asking you questions that he wants action to. He's asking questions he already knows the answer to. And he's calling you to claim your inheritance for your sake, for your benefit, and for the benefit of others. Because he's already went forth 2,000 years ago to give us every opportunity we need. He is already alive. He is already living in us if you're saved today. He is in you. He's the hope of glory. And we're all here together to go forward in faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand up then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Welcome to HBF. Um, excellent uh, day. It's nice and uh, warm outside. It's balmy 40-something degrees. And it is great to be here. Well, hey, if you have your Bibles, we turn to the book of Joshua chapter 18. We're going to continue our study this morning in Joshua, claiming our inheritance, and we're going to discuss how long will it take for us to claim our inheritance this morning. Uh, we had a great time last Sunday night at the Lord's Supper, so I'm reminded of uh, Psalm 133 in verse 1, which says, Behold, how good and pleasant is it for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And uh, it is good to be together today, this morning, and to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Great time of praising and reflecting on the resurrection and uh, on the incarnation, all those things that are so important um, to who we are because our identity is in Christ. This morning, I want to just, uh, as we're all cleaned up and ready to go, I want to just speak to you this morning about uh, where we are this December. And I want to remind you that this time last year, uh, well, just about a month from now, uh, it will be a year that I rolled out the theme uh, for the year, which was REAP, where we talked about recognizing the need, entering the field, uh, act responsibly with urgency, and pray effectively. And we've been talking about that and kind of had that on the agenda since uh, January of last year. We went through the Vision Conference, and, and we've really trusted God to do those things. And, uh, and so we're, uh, we're underway. And as we look at uh, uh, this time last year, we were already in the book of Joshua, and we were memorizing Joshua 1, 8, and 9, that passage that says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Uh, for then shalt thou make thy way uh, uh, prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, and be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That was the passage as a group we were working on. And that was the passage, the introductory uh, comments that we had from the book of Joshua. Joshua was charged to go forward in faith and claim the inheritance. And so this morning, as we, uh, you know, we're coming into to Christmas, right, and, and we all focus in, uh, on the birth of Christ, and, and of course the kids are ready for gifts, uh, and that we think about getting. Uh, well, this morning we're going to talk about getting, getting the inheritance that God has given us. And I want to ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing this morning? with those things that we've talked about? How are we doing with the Word of God in our hearts? How are we doing um, with uh, not being afraid, neither being dismayed, knowing that the Lord thy God is with us? We just sang about that or just talked about that, right? How uh, we got to believe that He is, right? You got to believe that He is alive from the dead, that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And, uh, and we, we don't seek something that we don't believe is tangible, that's not real. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, right? And uh, there is, uh, there's the substance of things not seen. And I've got the verse butchered and I don't have it written down. But uh, faith 
Anybody help me out with that. Faith is the substance of things not seen, the evidence of things hoped for. Say that one more time. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There we go. Thank you very much. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and uh, the evidence of things not seen. Is that backward? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, this is a Bible-believing church, and this is good. Now, that is actually excellent. When I say something, I want, I, we should be checking the Word because the Word is the absolute authority. And that, that is the point, actually, is that, is that uh, Joshua and the nation of Israel, they were claiming God's Word. And they, were, and they were trusting God for what was, you know, within their grasp. And they went forward, they grabbed hold of it, and God moved them into victory. And he points us uh, forward, and he takes us in to claim our inheritance, just as the children of Israel did that uh, in the nation of Israel, in the promised land. And then, of course, we saw how they moved uh, from Gilgal to Shiloh. And last uh, Sunday night, we took time and we talked about that process of uh, how God moved the, the, the meeting place from Gilgal to the center of where the nation of Israel was at there in Shiloh, in Ephraim. Uh, and we talked about the significance of that location. We talked about what it pictured in the person of Jesus Christ and how it's to be remembered. Now this morning as we come together, uh, we're going to look in this text in Joshua chapter 18 and verse 1 through 10 again. We're going to rehearse it again. And you see in verse 1, if you look at the text, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh. The whole congregation, everyone was together. And it goes on to say, and the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet uh, received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, how long are you slack to go possess the land which the Lord God your fathers hath given you? Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coasts on the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their coasts on the north. You shall therefore describe the land into seven parts and bring the description hither to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God." But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east, uh, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And the men arose and went away, and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it, and come again to me, that I may uh, here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities into seven parts in a book and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land of the children of Israel according to their divisions. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, uh, Lord, just making us whole in Christ and Lord, giving us and granting us an inheritance and giving us an identity in Christ, which can be articulated, it can be described, it can be possessed, Lord. We thank you so much for possessing our vessels, Lord. We thank you so much for giving us uh, eternal life in Jesus Christ. So I pray today, as we go forward in the text, Lord, that you just quicken your word in our hearts, Lord, that you would use this message in our lives, uh, that it would be effectual, Lord, that we would leave no promise unturned, as Hebrews speaks of, Lord, that uh, we've entered into this rest, Lord. I pray, God, that we would uh, be able to avail ourselves of all your glory in the time that we have so that we can bring it back and give it to you at your throne. We just thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at this passage this morning, we're going to see that uh, Joshua charges the children of Israel to make a decision. They've got to make a decision. And that decision is to take their division. They've all got these, uh, this property, these seven tribes that are left. They have property that they need to claim. And then we're going to talk about how we need to give back uh, in appreciation to the Lord in, Revel in a Revelation, in Joshua chapter 19. And so this morning, as you look at the first seven verses, what we saw as we were reading the text is as the whole congregation came together, Joshua really is not pleased, which is a shame because uh, the, the land has all been subdued, it says. It says they've, they've all assembled together, the whole congregation, all 12 tribes. That would include the tribes on the uh, eastern side of Jordan. 
And they're all at Shiloh. They set up the tabernacle. We talked about that Sunday night. And the land was subdued before them. So everything had been conquered. The victory was theirs. We, we spent the first half of Joshua's study talking about getting the victory. Well, now they have the victory. And, uh, and, uh, and so now they're in a position where uh, they need to take and claim that inheritance. Probably, I believe, at least seven years has, has gone by by this point. And uh, they're still not settled all the way, the way that God would have them to be. In verse 2, it says, And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes in particular, uh, which uh, had not yet received their inheritance. Now, of course, the land was conquered, and they had that uh, inheritance. Everyone knew whose property was who, but they hadn't yet really moved in and taken possession as God had commanded. And really this morning as I talk to you, I just want to ask you, how long before we claim the victory? How long before we claim uh, the victory? Now you say, well, I'm saved. Well, I hope you are. I mean, that's obviously where we want to start. But God has more for us than that. If that was all there was, then when you got saved, he would just take you out of here. And so God has left us here to accomplish his mission. That's why here at HBF, the mission is to equip the saints of God, those that are saved, in the word of God to accomplish the mission of God. Our life is really wrapped up in what God left for his disciples, and we are his disciples. We're to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So he's given us all power to go to all nations and teach them all things whatsoever he has said to us, and that's what we do. And, uh, and so, practically speaking, God has given us this local New Testament church. It's a visible uh, assembly. The whole congregation, as far as we uh, are concerned here within this local church, is y'all, right? So we come together, and uh, we just did that Sunday night. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. Jesus is the Messiah. Picture Shiloh. He was, he was beaten. He was wounded for our transgressions. And so we remember that, and that is how we have been able to get this inheritance And so what are we doing with this? Well, some of us need to be educated, right? Some of us need to grow and be discipled in the Lord. Then we need to learn the word of God. We need to learn what promises God has given us so that we can go forth and claim them. Uh, Others of us, we know those things, and uh, but yet we struggle, right, to to go back. We want to go back to Egypt or go back to the wilderness. And God says, no, 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 you need to go forward. Forget those things that are behind and press forward toward the mark because there's much more ahead and God has left us here in this season of life so that we can claim the promises that he has given us. And so as you think about that, this this had an impact on the whole congregation. Why was Joshua bringing this up? What did he care? Well, he cared because he cared for the whole congregation just like Jesus cares for the church. The church is his bride. And you know what the reality is, is that all of the churches, whether this local church, another local church, all of the members of the body in particular affect the other members. It's important. There's seven tribes that haven't done what it is that God set them apart to do. They're not fully fulfilling the mission of God in their life. And so, and so that's an issue. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 20, but now are ye many members, yet but one body. And in America, oftentimes, you know, that's kind of how we roll. We're, hey, I'm my own man. I do what I do. We do my, I do my thing, right? And God says, yeah, you are your own. You're a member of the body, but you're one body. Your identity is not only in Christ. It's also identified with Christ in the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. You're part of the local New Testament church. That's why uh, all the ordinances point toward that, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Uh, that, that points us back to what God has established, his ordained institution, the local New Testament church, the word of God, the spirit of God, which quickens us and baptizes us spiritually at salvation, and the Holy Spirit of God that teaches us all things, whatsoever he said to us from the word of God, among the assembly of God. Uh, and so God feeds us, and there's a supernatural anointing that God places on us as a whole. That's why we come together. Because uh, it doesn't matter if it's me or someone else in this pulpit. It's really about the process that God has established. And we go forth by faith, trusting him for fruit, supernatural fruit. And we know that there's a special blessing that comes in the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26, that same chapter, Paul went on to teach the church. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And so he reminds them again, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, meaning y'all have a role in what God is doing in his body. A member, we even call our members, our body parts, right? Our fingers, 
uh, our arms, those are members, different parts of the body. So if you look at it from a mathematical term, as Joshua's looking at where God is at with his nation Israel as a whole, it's composed of those 12 tribes. And of course, we've got the Levites that are set apart. And we've got the, the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, who make up the difference. And so you got all of these components that God is using to get them where they need to go. 58% of them are not going where they need to go. They're not doing what it is that God has set them apart to do. And let me ask you this morning, are you, are you that person? Are you one that, that God has called you to, to be like him, but yet for some reason you just resist being filled with the Holy Spirit of God and you want to serve your flesh? I hope that's not us. I hope that's not our church among the churches. Let's say, let's preventure that there were, you know, the churches in America or the churches in the metro or the churches in the city, I don't care. Just take a division and say 58% of them just aren't doing it. They're just not really wholeheartedly serving the Lord. Man, I, I, do you want to be that person? I know I don't. And I know this church, I know y'all, you don't want to be that church. If 58% of the saved congregation this morning were simply riding on the coattails of others, how would that feel? I mean, that actually set in on me years ago when we first started uh, Heartland and, and uh, we were in the school. And um, <clears throat> back then, I, you know, I could count pretty much on one hand. Uh, it was pretty exciting to get things started, but after the first, you know, uh, first year or so, I realized, you know, when you looked at uh, the group that started the church, you could pretty much decide, you could determine that uh, who was supporting the church. The same group that started the church, but yet the numbers were swelling in our little bitty building over there. And I'm like, how did that, how does that work? And it gave me, you know what it did in my heart, though? It gave me great admiration for the, the, the founding members of HBF because they, they, they carried the load of a lot of people who were just gawkers. You know what I mean? They just kind of come around and go, wow, what's going on in here? I like it. I'm comfy. You know, and that's cool. But you know what? There was a faithful group of people that were just paying the bill. And I don't mean just financially. I mean taking care of the kids. I mean taking, you know, doing all the work. There's work. Do you know there's work in ministry? Yeah, if you're involved in ministry, you know it. There's work to be done. And so can you imagine if, if uh, 42% were laying down or 58% were laying down and only 42% were getting it done? Now, they say in, the, in the most churches, it's actually, what is it, 20% are doing the work of ministry and 80% aren't. I don't, believe, I don't believe that's the case at Heartland at all. So I don't have that perspective at all for Heartland. I think you guys are very industrious. But uh, the tribes, 58% of them, were not exactly doing all that they needed to do. Now, they were helping. And the other tribes, <coughs> they, uh, it, they'll just think about this. What would happen if they didn't do what they were supposed to do? If they didn't inhabit their cities, plow their fields, create their commerce, if they didn't, uh, if they didn't pay their own way, who was going to take care of those seven tribes? Who would defend them when the time came to muster troops? Right? When the king of Assyria uh, wants to roll in on top of them, who's going to be there for them? Uh, who would supply them if they decided to go to war? Who's going to get the food where it needs to go? And Joshua was challenge, challenging these seven tribes to step it up for the sake of national security. Get in your promises and get secure, get established, get your roots in, get your systems going so that you can benefit the whole. Be who it is that God has set you apart to be so that you can, in your division, you can come together as a whole. He needed 12 twelfths, right? He didn't need four twelfths. He needed it all to be together so there was a whole. Could you imagine if 58% of the parents didn't help out in the kingdom kids? What kind of load that is on the others that do? Or if 58% of the people at a church didn't tithe or give? What kind of burden or what kind of limitations that might put upon now, you, you don't want to limit the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel. Is that possible? I don't know. I'll tell you this. The, re the reality is I don't know. But you know who does know? Somebody give me, give me the answer. God knows. Joshua knows. Jesus knows. Because you can fool me all the time. I can fool you. But you know what? The reality is who really knows what we're doing? That's right. Jesus knows. Joshua's name is Jesus. And Jesus, Joshua is not pleased. He says, hey guys, come on. 
get, let's get going here. Let's get, let's get in our inheritance. The Lord could, could be asking this among the seven churches today. How long before we answer the... What if 58% of the people are not listening to God knocking at the door? Revelation chapter 3. And they're just ignoring God. Of course, this being the door, he is the door of the sheepfold. This is the word of God in my bulletin too. And so this is not inspired literature right here. I'm going to put this right here. What if we're not listening to God's voice? That would be terrible. Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel thee to buy me gold, try in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. How long before we answer the knock at the door, asking us to buy of him gold, silver, and precious stones? Address the question. Look down here in verse 3. He says, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? How long are ye slack? I mean, that just, that just sounds rough, doesn't it? You slacker. That's the first thing I think of. You slacker. How long are you slack? The word slack, what, what's that imply? Loose, right? Give me some slack. Cut me some slack. Give me some, hey, pull the, don't restrain me. Loosen that up. If it's a rope, right? If it's taut, it's tight. If you give it some slack, it's loose. Jesus, is, uh, Joshua's here saying, hey guys, tighten things up. Get your act together. Go forward. How are you continuing to be so loose about this matter? Too laid back. Ask yourself this morning, is there a sin of omission in my life? I hope not, because we just had the Lord's Supper last week. and so, But it doesn't take long, does it, to get slack? It doesn't take long at all. Something that is easy within your grasp, what the Lord's telling you to do, but you just don't want to do it. You just keep procrastinating, like, you know, exercising. Ew, I hate that. No, I like to work out. I just don't like to work out. You see, you know how that works? It's just, I just don't do it. Y'all, I know about it. As I was preparing this, I'm telling you, I'm just bearing my soul. That's one of the things God was like, hey, Brian, how long are you going to be slack in this area of your life? I'm like, well, I don't want to go to bed early. You know, that is the issue, isn't it? I don't want to give up you know, my time. I want, to go, I, want to, I want to go to bed, you know, later. And if I'm going to exercise, i got to go to bed earlier. Something else has to go. And i got to decide what's important. It may be in your character, right? Are you slack? Am I slack in my character? It's never an attitude, or an attribute, I'm sorry, of Jesus or Joshua's character. You never see in the Word of God where Jesus is slack. Now, there's times he's accused of being slack. We know even in Peter, he's accused of being slack because he hasn't executed judgment as quick as everybody wants. But he's not slack. Joshua is not slack. These men were industrious. God is industrious. He knows exactly what he's doing, and when he moves, he moves. Proverbs 10, 4 says this, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. You ever met that person? Oh, man, I need, I need, I need, I need. But they don't lift a finger to do, do, do anything. It's like, hey, man, that's a, you got a slack hand. You need to be diligent. You need to be diligent. Beloved, listen, God has given us these promises. And you're just not going to, like, fall out the end of your Bible into the top of your head. If you really want to grasp hold of the inheritance that God has for you, you've got to put some diligence to this thing. You, gotta, you can't be slack in the way you approach the Word of God, just nonchalant. Oh, yeah, it's that book over there. My whole soul's resting on it. My eternal life, is, I'll pick it up once a week, maybe when I roll into church and let Brian, who's already been, spent time in it, roll out what he's learned from the Bible. Well, that's good. That's why we're here. But my goodness, I hope there's more going on between Sunday to Sunday than what you heard from me. There, there needs to be some diligence in the word of God else what's going to happen is you're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and it's going to be too late to go back and pick up on that promise that was delivered you I fear that many Christians this morning are not willing to answer the question posed by the Holy Ghost as he asks us how long are we slack 
I remind you, saved, blood-washed, born-again, Bible-believing Christians, that we will give an account of the things done in the body after our salvation, whether they be good or bad. The time of our life to mope around like victims is over. This is not a time for Israel to wander around in the wilderness and wonder what they're doing. This is a time where they are in victory lane. It is time to go forward with the promises of God. The time of our life to mope like victims is over and it's high time to rise in obedience to God's commands and life in the fullness of Christ. Life is just a vapor. It appears for a little while and it fades away. And God only gives us these bodies for just a moment where we can actually choose to glorify Him or choose to sin and lay down. This is the time that we have to glorify Him and choosing to serve Him, to, to go forward by faith. 1 Corinthians 3 says this, For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, you know, a building project that's not strenuous? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, what are you putting on it? Because you are working, you are laboring, you are getting by. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Oh, too many Christians like, Woo! I'm saved! Hallelujah! I'm going to go back to sleep now. Really? Uh, Jeff Barker mentioned that last week. That's really not your nature if you're saved. You need to go forward in faith. If any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. For we must all, 2 Corinthians 5.10, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Romans 10, uh, 14.10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Why are we comparing ourselves with ourselves? That's not wise. He goes on to say, For what shall, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, meaning that our measuring stick is not one another. Our measuring stick is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. So what we did last Sunday night has everything to do with standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Because our obedience or disobedience impacts who? Everyone. It impacts everyone. If you're saved, it impacts everyone. My obedience, believe me, my disobedience impacts y'all. Likewise, your obedience or your disobedience impacts us all. It's a sobering thing to think about. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, he says in verse 31, For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, because we answer to the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, tarry one for another. Now that passage I just read comes from the passage that we just celebrated last Sunday night, the Lord's Supper where we come together around the, the body of Christ and we remember it's not the body of Christ, we don't do transubstantiation, but we come together and we, and we reflect on Jesus, Shiloh, curse for us, and, and we remember what he sacrificed for us, and we remember that because of him we are one body and that our life bears witness. Now, so he asks this question, he's expecting an answer. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't say anything, they just acted. And then he commands, he says, hey, give me a witness. You like that? You like that in the old church there? Give me a witness. Can I have a witness? Jesus, Joshua is saying, give me a witness in verse 4. Give out from among you three men for each tribe. Joshua asked for these three men. The first time we see three men in Scripture, Genesis chapter 18 and verse 2. When Jesus shows up with his two disciples uh, with, uh, before he goes and destroys, allows those angels to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. There are three of them. First time you see that, that phrase, three men. Those three men show up, and, and Abraham uh, entertains them, right? Uh, you know that passage from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 2. It's a witness of God's blessing on Abraham and mercy upon Lot. 1 Samuel 10, 13, the same thing happens again. Uh, and Saul is anointed by Samuel, and he goes forth. And uh, as uh, he goes forth, he's going to meet these three men. 
They're going to be bringing a provision for him. And it's a witness to Saul of God's anointing of him as king of Israel. In Job 32, 1, Job had three friends. Well, he had four, but three that were counted. The three men are mentioned there in his, tri- in his tribulation. Job's three friends witnessed Job's piety through his suffering. In Ezekiel 14, 14 through 8, Noah, Daniel, and Job are mentioned by the Lord. And, he said, and he's mentioning them as witnesses of the severity of God's judgment on Israel, saying, listen, I'm still judging Israel, even though there's Noah, even though there's Daniel and there's Job, three men. And he mentions them by name. Daniel 3, 23, you know these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're three witnesses, along with Jesus, who shows up in the fiery furnace as a witness to Nebuchadnezzar of the fiery furnace, uh, or that fiery furnace trial revealed to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, one like the Son of God. Matthew 17, 2, there's three men. Oh, let me back up. Acts chapter, well, let me do Matthew. Matthew 17, 2, three men, Peter, James, and John, uh, see him transfigured prior to his crucifixion and ascension. In uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 19 and 11, 11, God sent three men to confirm, confirm his vision to Peter of the gospel going to the Gentiles without any constraint of the law. Three men. But the last three I want, to, I want to remind you is 1 John 5. This is my eighth example, 7 and 8. John records three witnesses, one in heaven. He says the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. These three bear witness. And he says there's three witnesses on earth, earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And of course, all the witnesses wrap up and remind us that God bears witness of what's gone on on this earth. And he is the one who's the rightful redeemer of it. He's the one who's purchased it. The blood and the water and the spirit confirm that. These men were to be witnesses of what God had provided to the seven remaining tribes, recording their borders, their cities, and their natural resources, and their waterways, and their mountains, and their springs, all that stuff. They were to go forth and document that according to their division, what God had given them. It takes two men to spy out a land for military purposes and three men to document it. And provide what God and bring back what God wanted them to see. It's interesting to me how that works. So give. So not only did He want them to give an answer, and not only did He want them to give men, He also He also wants them to give to others. In verse seven, He mentions the Levites once again. The Levites keep bouncing up every time we roll through an inheritance passage, and He reminds us that their part is among the priesthood of the Lord. That's their inheritance. Gad, Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh already had their inheritance on the east side of Jordan. And uh, God had provided, once again, uh, for this, this, uh, the Levites to inherit the priesthood of the Lord. Uh, for, the other, <clears throat> for the others to claim their inheritance required constant intercession at the tabernacle. And I believe one of the things that we can remember from this is that prayer is a priority for what? For unity. Prayer is a priority for unity. You've heard the saying before, those that pray together, stay together. Hey, do you pray? Hey, there's something practical today. Do you pray with your wife? Do you pray with your husband? Do you pray with your kids? It's just practical stuff like that. It takes two men to spy it out. It takes three men to record it. And then there's always those Levites that are busy about doing what God called them to do among the, among the tabernacle or the temple, depending where they are in their history. As Christians, we can identify with this as we are not focused on the kingdom of heaven promises, right? All those physical promises in the kingdom of heaven. But what are we? We're focused on the kingdom of God, a spiritual inheritance. While Jesus, our Joshua, deals with the physical matters of the kingdom of heaven. Now, how long until we claim our inheritance? Well, you know what? The decision is ultimately whose? It's ours. You know, Joshua doesn't beat anybody into submission. He just asks the questions. How long? Because you're holding up the progress of everybody else. You're holding up everyone else. How long? How long, y'all? Well, of course, I like the response of those seven tribes. In verse 8, it says, And the men arose. Notice, notice who rose. The women and children arose and led the church. Nothing, uh, praise the Lord for women and children. But too many times, that's all that rise up. The men arose. The men arose. The men arose. Oh, how many wives are sitting around waiting for that man to rise up? When is he going to get up and follow the Lord? And how many a man is so convoluted in his own ignorance that he really doesn't think that Jesus' work is man's work? 
He's got some false, di- false paradigm of what a man is to start with. And he's going about like a little bitty boy running around through this life with his ball cap on and his jersey trying to emulate some ball player. And he missed out on the one that God saved him to emulate. And that's Jesus Christ. Hey, man, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's man's work. It's not boy's work. Sometimes Jesus is calling some of y'all to grow up. Grow up. Be a man. Quit yourselves like boys. No, quit yourselves like men. Prepare. Go forward. He needed some men to stand up, and the men arose and went away. And Joshua charged them that went to describe the land. And it's a reiteration of what we've already seen. Go and walk through the land. It says in verse 8 there, Go and walk through the land and describe it and come again to me, that I may he- uh, here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. Now, God doesn't ask questions because he needs answers. I want you to understand that. He's not standing at the door knocking because he really needs anything from us. He's standing at the door knocking because he wants to give us something that we need. He wants us to buy of him, not because he needs us, he needs us to get anything from him. It's because he wants to give us something that's good for us. Merry Christmas. He wants to bless us because he's good. His nature is good. He's holy. He's true. He's incredible. Joshua, he's not asking these questions because he needs answer. He asks them because we need answers. Would they even know what they were lacking if the question wasn't asked? Would they have continued in their slothfulness, in their, in their, in their slack, slacking attitude? Would they have just continued on, just going on indefinitely? Until Joshua asks, perhaps the Spirit of God descends upon us in moments and, and, and he asks us questions. And when he asks them, it's not because he really needs the answer. He already knows it. It's because we need the answer. And these guys answered. They're like, yes, Joshua, you're right. You're right. God doesn't ask questions because he needs answers. He asks them because, listen, he needs action. He doesn't ask questions because he, he, has, he really doesn't know the answer. He's given us an opportunity to answer those questions with an action, to take a responsibility, to move at his word, to move at his command by faith. When I worked in the business world, most of the time people asked me questions that they weren't really wanting to know the answer to. They already, I knew the answer, right? They wanted to know when. Brian, when is my project going to be done? What time you think, when, how many days you think that's going to take? Now, in that little question, hey, Brian, when do you think my project's going to be done? You know what that meant? Well, what that really meant was, hey, um, how are you coming on those drawings? No, that's not really what, it, they weren't really like interested in, well, how many hours have you put in these drawings? Are you doing okay? Your wife doing good? Your family doing good? I just care about you so much. I'm, I'm curious to know, how's it coming with those drawings that you're working on? I love your drawings. They look so good. That's not really what they're asking. Now, it often came across that way. Very polite, very cordial. But this is really what they were saying. Translation. And if you don't get this translation, you're not going to be very good at business, by the way. Uh, when are you going to be done? That's what they meant. When are you done? Because, Brian, listen, this is what's going on. When, I need to get those things stamped, and they got to get back from the city. And I'm waiting on you, because if you don't get those to the city, things aren't going to move on this project. And, because once they get back from the city, we got to coordinate, and, and we got to get those things back and get our permits, because i got to schedule some men. And i got to get the ductwork fabricated. The duct's got to get fabricated. Uh, we got to buy the pipe, and, and we got to get the men where they need to go. The crew's got to hit the jobs. And, 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 and while we're at it... Um, Brian, I got thousands of dollars of equipment. It's gonna, is it going to land at Haggard or is it going to go to the job site? I need to know because it's all hinging on you. Your drawings are going to make the difference. Can you document some things for me? Can you lay this thing out? Can you get it approved? Can you get it through? Why? Because, because, my, because listen, if this doesn't all happen on time, my customer's not going to be happy. The job's going to be impacted and we're going to lose money. We're not going to make the money. Because it's, it's all about the money. Because when can I start my billing? 
Is it time to start that yet? All that's wrapped up in the little question, how are those, how are those drawings coming? You got, anybody got a witness? Now, I'm not, I'm not mad about that. That's just the business world, isn't it? That's the way it works. I know that y'all live that stuff every day. That's just how it is. But you know, when you think about it, we'll give our bosses and our businesses more reverence than the Holy Spirit at times. When God says, hey, how's it coming there, Brian? How's it going down there at Heartland? How's your 49-year plan? You know what I feel like doing? Just ask the pastor team or the office. I feel like getting to work. <laughs> I feel like running harder. You're like, man, Brian, it's a year of rest coming up. I know, but I want to run harder. Why? Because I know time is limited. I know that what we do here impacts the job. Now, guys, does God need us? No. Does he really need my physical effort? No. Does he really need us at all? No. He wants us. He chooses us because he loves us. And he tells them, and notice Israel, by the way, they did not send a delegation to discuss it. They just sent witnesses to walk it out. They just went and did it. So we're commanded to walk in the Spirit. We should walk every day in, the world, in this world understanding that we are a witness. This is the, the word, this is, um, in this world, we now have an inheritance, and our inheritance is Jesus Christ. So we walk through the land, and then we write it. He tells them in verse 9 to write it down. Those are some, some of the most powerful words ever recorded in the Bible, for they give the sense of God's power and dominion. It, it, is, it was by the word of God that the world was created. So to this day, writing constitutes the parameters of law and inheritance. Uh, if you're going to do something of any consequence, you write it down. You know, the, the, the founding fathers didn't just yell across the pond, hey guys, we're going to succeed. No, they wrote it down. They made it legal and binding. They said, no, this is exactly what we're claiming. And they wrote it down. And then they had to live it out if they wanted to actually have that liberty. And so you write it down. And all this was written and returned back to Joshua. What a tremendous picture of what the scriptures say in Isaiah 55, 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. He says, hey guys, go out and then come back to me. Come back to Joshua. <coughs> I want to see the record. There will be a day in the millennium when we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. We'll come back. He'll come back for us and we'll go up with him. We're going to be with him. And there's going to be a day once he returns at the second coming. And we open up the book of Ezekiel, chapter 48. And all those promises are going to come back. <coughs> and we're going to watch God distribute the promised land back to the nation of Israel. That's going to be incredible. It's already written down for us in the book. It's already documented. It's already legal. Now, the UN don't recognize it. Uh, none of the nations of the world recognize it today. But the reality is I got a legal document here in Ezekiel 48. It says, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what God has ordained. Practically speaking, let me put some handles on this for you. <clears throat> One of the things I would recommend that we all do is write down what we're trusting God to claim. <clears throat> and just practically, I'll just share with you what I do daily. In my, in the, I journal my devotional time with God. I write down the things I'm trusting God for. I just write them down. Uh, annually, as, as I see God's guidance, you know what, I have a plan for my family. And I write it down. This is what I'm trusting God for. Um, <clears throat> specifically, when it comes to initi uh, initiatives in your life that God is calling, to you, calling you to accomplish for His glory, if you come to me with a, with a ministry idea of any consequence, you know what, what's the first thing I'm going to ask you to do? Write it down. I don't do that just be, well, I do that for a couple of reasons. One, because I can't remember anything hardly anymore. But the other reason is because <clears throat> it's good for us to write down what is it that we're trusting God for? Because it's by that that we'll measure it later. What is it that God's ca called you to do? Write it down. If you can't write it down, then I don't know that he's called you to do it. Every seven years, I sit down and prayerfully consider God's plan for the church. 
I know God's will for the church. I know what he tells us we're to be doing. But there's also some things specifically, <coughs> decisions. What, God, how, are, how is this going to happen? Write it down. Pray about it. Review it. Ask God to guide you. Habakkuk chapter 2, the Bible says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon a tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. <coughs> Excuse me. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2 is a great passage in regard to, to really waiting on what God has written. And, and then you know what was cool about this passage is they were free to go claim it. They had that liberty from Joshua. Go get it. He cast lots at the temple door. He says, guys, now that is not like divination like you, you'd have with a paganism. <coughs> this wasn't important enough to get the Urim and the Thummim out and, and uh, you know, beseech the Lord. God had already told them to go. So all they were doing is just coming up, just, you know, well, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. Okay, no, here. Whoever, we'll just cast lots and they'll go first. And that's what they did. Joshua sorted that out. In his, he just, they trusted the providence of God. And however that lot fell is how they went forth. But they went forth is the point, And they claimed it. Not because they were wagering, but because uh, they were... Up until, by the way, that's how Israel did things up until Acts chapter 2. And once the indwelling Holy Spirit came, we don't have to do that anymore because we have the Spirit of God within us. What did He do? He leads us and guides us as we follow His Word, as we submit to the structure of the local New Testament church and the government and the family structure. As we submit to those things, God directs us and guides us. I would not recommend, by the way, practicing forms of divination for guidance today. That's becoming popular, even among the church. Um, and so God directed them to go claim the inheritance. How long will we claim? How long will it be before we claim the inheritance? How long? We've got to make a decision. We've got to take our division. But the last thing I want to just encourage you as we wrap up here is we need, we need to... Uh, we need to make sure that we show our appreciation. Turn to chapter 19 and verse 49. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 19 and verse 49. When they had made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their coasts, the children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of, the, of Nun, among them. Uh, hold on, rewind the tape. Why is it that Joshua is the last to get his inheritance in verse 49? Well, that's why we need to show our appreciation because Joshua, picture of Jesus Christ, puts others ahead of himself. He puts others ahead of himself. He put the nation of Israel ahead of, of his own personal need. You know why he did that? Because he knows the Lord's going to provide. The Lord will take care of him. And so because he, play, he, because he did that, we should show appreciation because he placed our inheritance ahead of his own. Before Jesus took his place at the right hand of God, as he sat next to the Father, you know what he did? He claimed his place on earth. He came and dealt with our sin issues. What, would if he did, what if the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost would have just said, you know, this is a mess. This whole Satan and Adam and, yeah. Let's just get rid of it and go ahead. Because we're, self, we're self-contained unit here. We're one. We don't need anything. Do they need anything? God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything. He chose. He chose us. He chose to step out and become incarnate. He chose to die. He chose to include us in him. That's because he loves us. There's a great song by down here called How Many Kings. It's, it's a Christmas song. How many kings step down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? How many <clears throat> gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Hey, while we were dead in trespassing sins, while we were still sinners, right? Christ died for us. We should show some appreciation. He's not telling us you got to do anything. You can lounge around all you want. But he didn't lounge around when it came to our sin. Before I was even born, he'd already dealt with my sin. He's so diligent. 
That's why we celebrate the Advent season, the coming of Christ. Shiloh was placed in our midst, judged for our sin, so we could inherit eternal life. He was pla- and because he placed his inheritance in our midst, we should also praise him. In verse 50, his, his, uh, Tim Math Sarah in Mount Ephraim, he places his physical location right next to that tabernacle, that place of worship. He's central to the worship. Joshua is always near the tabernacle, whether it's in the wilderness, whether it's in Gilgal, whether it's in uh, Tim Math Jira, whether it's up there in Mount Ephraim. He's always where the tabernacle's at. So this, this morning, we praise God. Why? Because he's in our tabernacle, 2 Corinthians 5. He's inside of us. He was at the center of Israel's worship. Joshua was located near the tabernacle. And thirdly, because he recorded our inheritance before God. You'll see at the end of verse 51, it says that, <clears throat> that, uh, that he and the... And the, the uh, the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He recorded our inheritance before God. It was an everlasting covenant, verse 51. You know, Jesus commanded Mary Magdalene not to touch him when she saw him, 